having learnt about the structure, the constitution, the medicinal properties of natural dyes, we will now start moving towards how natural dyeing is done. Even that is a little uh, tricky situation and it is to be learnt properly in order to get proper results. It is simple, but it still has its own procedural details which need to be understood. So, now in this lecture we have mainly basics of natural dyeing and we will go along and learn about the natural dyeing process. The knowledge and use of color or dye on cotton, wool and silk began with the dawn of the civilization and was first developed in the east, particularly in India. India has a long rich tradition of colored fabric design. There are many plants and some animal sources in nature that yield color and can dye fabric, leather, hair and other items. Humans started using dyes as soon as they were discovered, 6000 BC or even earlier. It is not possible to precisely locate the place of antiquity where dyeing was first known as an art. Evidence leads us to believe that different civilizations had each its own methods to be practiced. It is said that Egyptians learned this art as early as probably the Indian and the Chinese. In the medieval period, there were certain plants that were heavily relied on for most colors till the invent of the synthetic colors. So, from this we clearly understand that we were the forerunners in the art of natural dyeing. The other uh, civilizations or other cultures that used were Egyptian and Chinese. So, at least that much is confirmed that we started or we were one of the first ones to use natural dyes for natural dyeing. Dye yielding plant, color was considered by ancient people as a basic necessity as essential as food and water. The ancient people used exclusively dye stuffs of vegetable, mineral and animal origin, all easily obtained in their own vicinity. Natural vegetable dyes have been used in most of the ancient civilization in different countries that is India, Egypt, Greece, Rome, etc. In India, use of vegetable dyes in dyeing, painting, printing goes back to prehistoric periods. So, we have just learned and when we were learning the history of dye stuff, that time also we learned mostly the history of the natural dyes, because the synthetic dyes have come uh, into the market very recently after the advent of the synthetic dyes in 1856 or so on. So, before that it was only natural dyes and there were people were collecting dye yielding plants from their vicinity, because procuring such plants was easy. It was not that somebody who was staying down south was trying to get a plantation from the northeast. That was not possible, that was not feasible. People were relying on three main sources. One was the vegetative force, uh, source that is from the plants. The second was the animal source, very few uh, dyes have been extracted from animal source. We have seen lac dye and cochineal are two such examples and sometimes some minerals were used which were colored and they were colored because of the transition metal that was present. So, basically they were metal salts or metal oxides of transition metals. In India, According to the information collected so far, there are nearly 300 dye yielding plants available. Based on this, 30 raw materials were taken and some work was done by using these dyes on cotton, silk and wool. And today of course, in our laboratory itself, we have worked on more than 60 plants. So, uh, it is every day new research is happening.
and every time there is a new uh, dye yielding plant which is uh, identified or screened, it is evaluated for its dyeing property for on cotton, silk and wool. Some are very good with silk and wool because of their proteinaceous nature, but others are good on the cellulosic fiber. So, therefore, these dye plants may have different adherability, but they basically are meant for dyeing. If uh, we isolate, go on isolating many, many, many plants, it is of no use unless they are used in application of dyeing. Advantages of natural colors, let us just go on to revise because why is natural dyeing having a revival? What is the reason for its resurgence? Is because there are certain very marked advantages with these natural colors. Natural dyes bearing eco mark are eco friendly and acceptable in today's world. They are non toxic, non allergic, hazard free for skin. Fastness can be achieved by the use of proper mordants. They are safe for the life, environment, fuel and time and other investment processes. So, it, it is found that they certainly have more advantageous situation than their counterpart synthetic dyes. They are very safe to handle and for the uh, environment. They less amount of fuel and time is required for this and therefore, the total investment for a natural dyer is much less. For successful introduction of vegetable dyes into technical dyeing processes, some additional demands have to be fulfilled. Increase of number of available vegetable dyes with acceptable fastness properties suited for one bath dyeing processes, which means that if the vegetable dye has to come into the market, there are certain modification and acceptability that needs to be uh, honored. Otherwise, it will not be able to reach the common consumer market. And the main criteria for that is that the number of dye yielding plants should increase. But these dye yielding plants must have good fastness properties. It is not that we accumulate you know 500 plants and we list them, we screen them, but the dye content is very poor or the dyeing uh, ability is very poor or the dye uh, adherence is very poor or their wash fastness is very poor or their uh, light fastness is very poor. In that case, these dyes are not to be considered. Formation of an efficient supplier organization which is able to provide a dye house with standardized dyes of constant quality and to generate an inventory of suitable vegetable dyes from application point of view. So, it is very important. Screening is of course, one research activity, where newer and newer plants, newer and newer sources must be screened. But after screening, there is another very important exercise that needs to be done and that is that each dye should go through a very rigorous testing procedure of finding out the optical density, of finding out how is the dye adherence, to which fabric does it really uh, suit, whether it is suitable for cotton or silk or wool. These things have to be taken into serious account and then an inventory should be made that they, these are the color gamuts which can be obtained from these dyes and therefore, these dyes are worth uh, bringing into the commercial market. Unless and until this practice is done, it will not be of much utilization. More information about the basic dyeing process is that availability of technical information about the use of dyes collected from forest or locally grown plantation. Emphasis be made on production 
of plant material in sufficient amounts with modern agricultural methods, which would include simple and environmentally clean extraction methods suiting the requirement of the dye house. So, by now you at least understand what are the different methods of extraction of natural dye or vegetable dye and therefore, these things have to be taken into account. It is not that you know any plant that can be grown locally can be taken for a dye yielding plant. No, with modern agricultural methods the farming has to be improved so that that part of the plant see if we are uh, uh, trying to extract dye from flowers the plant must be flowering in huge quantity. So, those parameters have to be set where the uh, floral aspect can be enhanced. If suppose the fruit has the dye content, then the fruiting how fast the ripening of the fruiting can be done, how much in quantity the fruiting can be enhanced by adding some uh, plant hormones. So, that the total yield of this organized farming for the from the point of view of dye yielding plant material should be enhanced. Determination of eco friendliness of vegetable dyes for suitability for wearing dyed fabrics. Now, it is very important since we have already learnt about the toxicity of dyes and particularly the toxicity of uh, synthetic dyes. We need to testify this very fact that all the new dyes that are being screened for from the array of natural dye yielding plants must also be eco friendly. And for doing that we will dedicate one full lecture for testing the eco friendliness, but for doing that let me just briefly tell you that it is important to ascertain 4, 5 chemicals surely in the dye powder as well as in the dye fabric. And they are the, uh, the first is the presence of azo dye which actually releases amines and 22 banned amines we already know have been listed which are derivatives of azo dye. The second chemical is that when the uh, cotton is grown pesticide is sprayed on it for uh, preventing it from various attacks of pests and insecticides and herbicides and all those things are used. Now, these chemicals are come as a residue on the cotton and when this cotton is then uh, drawn into yarn and then the yarn is drawn into fabric, what happens is that the uh, pesticide residue continues. Now, because of that the uh, there is a residues of pesticides in the material and when it is dyed it is it is still persisting in that. So, one needs to test these dyed fabrics for the pesticide residues. Then there are heavy metals because during the process of natural dyeing metal salts are used as bridging heads. We will spend some time in this also. In the next lecture probably we will be talking about the mordants and uh, the, it is these metal mordants which may remain on the surface of the fabric and may be hazardous for the skin contact. Therefore, they should be tested for the eco friendliness. Similarly, when the uh, fabric is processed there is a lot of use of formaldehyde. So, how much of the formaldehyde is still remaining in the processed fabric? also needs to be evaluated because formaldehyde is also a skin irritant. So, therefore, all these 4 or 5 uh, notorious chemicals the toxic heavy metals, the banned amines, the pesticide residues and the formaldehyde need to be tested. Determination of biodegradability of waste generated after dye extraction from the plant sources that is well assured and ascertained because 
these plant material after the extraction of the dye are devoid of the dye, but have lot of pulp in that. The biotic material is either left for composting, which can be used in the agricultural farming processes or they can be burnt in uh, the furnaces where heat needs to be generated. But for burning in furnaces, they need to be dried up first and then only these biotic material can be used. So, there are two uses, but they are completely biodegradable. There is no problem about their uh, biodegrade, biodegradability. So, therefore, it is important to understand that there is the whole life cycle of the plant is fully complete. The dye is, the plant is grown, the dye is taken to the uh, dye uh, factory and the remaining extractant from the or the, the extractant is actually used for the dye uh, and the concentration of that gives us the dye powder or dye paste or whichever way we want to store it. And the biotic material is actually then sent for composting or for burning purposes. It is of utmost importance to know the structure of the dye. Depending on the dye structure, the mordant and the dye uptake is expected. Pretreatments are very important part of vegetable dye. Now, there is one very major drawback with the natural dyes that they are not structurally so modified that they can adhere to the fabric very nicely. In order for this nice reaction to occur, these moderns play a very vital role or some kind of a fabric pretreatment is required. Now, these fabric treatments could be of various type, use of uh, uh, metal mordants, use of bio mordants, use of all kinds of tannins and use of enzymes, use of PEG, all this is possible and all this is done mainly to enhance the uh, dye adherence or dye ability because otherwise the fabric and the dye are not very compatible. In order to make them come together, adhere and stick together, it is needed to have these kind of mordanting methods or pretreatment methods. If suppose pretreatment is not carried out, the dye will not adhere and I took the example of curcumin several times and I will again repeat that because curcumin does not have those oxochromes, enough oxochromes to attach to the metal or to attach to the fabric, therefore it is fugitive. Similarly, we find indigo. You will see that indigo also runs off very easily in the first few washing and that is because they, uh, the, uh, you have seen the indigo molecule, the in indigo tin, it does not have too many oxochromes. So, as a result, there, if there is a lack of oxochrome, the metals will not attach to it and when the metals do not attach to it, the, uh, the chelation to the fabric will not occur very readily. So, there is a lot of chemistry around this uh, art, but one needs to understand the basic structure of the dye. If the dye, you must have also remembered that these synthetic dyes which I mentioned and gave a comparative idea about the structures had lots of oxochromes and not only hydroxy group, they had sulfonic acid group and they were sodium salt of sulfonic acid and so on and so forth. So, that made a very good conjugation, that made very good oxochromic uh, contribution to these chelation process or adherence process. Natural dyeing principles. Application of natural dyes in today's scenario makes use of modern science and technology not only to revive the traditional technique, but also to improve its rate of production, cost of effectivity, cost effectivity 
and consistency in shades. It therefore requires some special measures to ensure evenness in dyeing. Many factors have to be accounted for when one works with natural dyes and they are as follows. So, when we are trying to learn about natural dyeing, we have to keep in mind a few factors. The first factor is nature of material to be dyed. Animal proteins like wool and silk dye best in acidic condition and are weakened by alkaline. If an animal protein is dyed in alkaline conditions, it is best to end with a diluted vinegar rinse to restore a slightly acidic pH to the fibers before they dry. Plant materials like cotton, flax dye best in alkaline or basic condition and are weakened by acids. If cotton is dyed in acidic conditions, it is best to end with a weak washing soda bath to restore the fibers to slightly alkaline before they dry. So, you see that if we are looking at the material, what is the basic nature of the material? If it is an animal protein like wool and silk, it is best to dry under acidic condition. And if it is uh, and if the dye solution is not even acidic, a final rinse with vinegar always adds one edge over the dyeing and the color comes out very brightly. Similarly, for cotton, flax, it is best to dye under alkaline condition, but when the alkali uh, or the pH is you know maintained at a particular pH, a final rinse with acid uh, so, uh, washing soda definitely helps in uh, restoring the color of the required shade. Measurements of modern and dye stuff. What should be the recipe? How much of modern should be used with how much of fabric? Because as I mentioned uh, in my last lecture that these measurements have to be very accurate. In order to have shade reproducibility, one cannot just take any amount and add to any amount and get the same result. It is not like that, just the way when we cook in our kitchen, we have a certain measurement uh, idea and th that idea is also followed here. So, most dyeing procedures specify ingredients by weight rather than measure. Re recipes will also specify the amount of fiber to be dyed or the other ingredients will be expressed as a ratio to fiber weight. This is because the amount of water in the dye bath will not affect how strongly the fiber takes color, but the amount of dye stuff in the dye bath does. So, it is very important that the water is to fabric, the dye is to uh, water, all these ratios are already fixed, so that the dye bath has a definite concentration of the dye powder. So, if 1 gram of fiber has to be dyed with 1 gram of dye stuff and then one wants to reproduce the same color on 5 more grams of fiber, the amount of dye stuff should be multiplied by 5 times as well. The water should always be enough to let the fiber move around freely. Water quantity should be sufficient to dip the fiber or the fabric properly, because if all these parameters are not taken into consideration, they what will happen that the evenness of dyeing will not occur. Somewhere the dyes, uh, dye powder will show aggregates and the other places will remain uh, faded. So, it will have a very patchy look. And any fabric which is dyed in a patchy manner cannot be considered as a good dyed material. Temperature is another factor which is to be considered, because when we are considering different parameters of basics of natural dyeing, temperature is a must to be considered. Different dyes work better at different temperatures. 
most dye plant dyes benefit from being heated, but some like madder change color if allowed to boil. Now, supan wood I gave you an example also has a tendency to change color when heated for prolonged hours. Some dyes work best uh, at lower temperatures that is safflower and wood or indigo. So, you see that we cannot have one hard and fast rule that all heating should be done at 100 degrees water boiling, because we think that the when the water is boiling that is the best temperature for uh, dyeing. That is not true, because some of the natural dyes are very heat sensitive and the examples that were now shown to you are madder and supan wood and they change to a very undesirable color and this process of change from good color to bad color is irreversible. So, once it changes to that bad color, it is not that cooling the dye solution will bring it back to its original color. So, as a result to avoid deterioration of the dye, it is important to keep a check on the temperature. Similarly, a check on temperature is required for safflower and indigo as well. Then it is also important that the rate of circulation of this dye solution should also be maintained, which we called as agitation. Agitation means shaking or swirling or mixing for getting even dye uptake. One should move the fiber around as much as possible in the dye pot. Why? Because otherwise dye aggregates will sit on one place and that will cause patchiness. But if the fabric is continuously moved, then the patchiness can be avoided. And therefore, it is important to understand that agitation like temperature plays a very important role in natural dyeing. Unfortunately, when wool is heated and agitated, it tends to felt. So, one must be very careful about how much one should move it around. For most wools heating and cooling the dye bath slowly and being gentle while moving the fiber is necessary to avoid felting. See what is felting? It is like uh, some uh, striations from the wool will come out. Now, if one is swirling the wool too hard because it is kind of a tender fiber. So, tender fibers need to be uh, addressed in a little softer manner, gentler manner, but cotton and all can be stirred very uh, or agitated at a high speed. And you will see that uh, as we go along, I will show you a machine of jigger. I will show you a machine uh, on which silk is dyed and these machines, the uh, winch machine or jigger machine do hold the fabric for uh, uh, at a very fast speed. But that speed optimization in case of wool is extremely important. Natural dyes are said to be unpredictable. Well, that is not truly so anymore, but initially books on natural dyes uh, can predict the range of colors, but will most likely be given from a dye source. But there are so many factors involved in the process that reproducing a color exactly can be very difficult unless those parameters are stri followed strictly. Some reasons for disappointing results could be insufficient heat or too much of heat, accidental iron or other metal contamination in the water, bad growing condition of the dye plant, plant harvested at the wrong time of the year, dye stuff allowed to dry out, dye stuff kept in humid condition, Dye stuff too old or dye obtained from the different plantation in terms of climate and soil conditions. So, the point here is to list some of the reasons for failure, which one would face if one does not get the expected color. The most experienced dyers in the world get accidental colors sometimes. One can over dye 
and get the desired color. So, the idea of telling you all this is that, that when the color cannot be reproduced or if it is not reproducible, there are so many factors which are listed here, one or all can be responsible for this unevenness or unlikeliness or undesirable result. So, in such a case, if one keeps all these factors in mind and tries to eliminate all the mistakes, all the possible mistakes, then one can definitely achieve good and correct result. Wet fibers always look darker. When trying to achieve a certain color, it has to be always remembered that the color when wet will always appear darker and may be disappointing when the fibers dry. Also, some color will rinse out after rinsing the fiber, always dyeing to a darker shade in the dye pot than what is required. Lifting the fiber out of the dye pot to air is often good for dyeing process to check the color. See what happens if we are trying to match the shade and we try to see that this shade is dark and the wet cloth is uh, almost matching but when it dries, it becomes lighter in color. So, in such a situation, there will be a discrepancy. Now, in order to avoid that discrepancy, it is, pos it is always advisable that the shade should be darker when it is wet. So, then only when it dries, it may come to the same shade, but if it does, if this is not kept in mind, and if a dry cloth and a wet cloth are mashed, after drying the wet cloth will become lighter in shade and there will be change in shade quality. So, it, it is important to point out these little little points because many a times natural dyers tend to make mistakes. So, the temperature, agitation and uh, you know wet fiber being originally a little darker than the dry fiber should be kept in mind. Now, I also told that over dyeing is possible. Over dyeing is possible because you see in natural dye, if the desired shade is not obtained, we can again put back the fabric into the dye bath and let it agitate at the required temperature for another one hour some more dye will be taken up. Let me tell you that dye is not taken up one at a time. It is always taken in uh, substantial quantity at you know at different instances. That is the reason why agitation is required. That is the reason why temperature is required and therefore, if over dyeing is uh, necessary to get the required shade, even that is possible in the case of natural dyes. Rinsing, fibers should be rinsed after they have dyed and some dyes will still bleed for several washings afterwards. You may have noticed that colors like magenta, peacock blue always run into the water or we say in terms of dyers language bleed. Now, this bleeding can cause that this color will run into another cloth if the uh, they are washed together. So, that that is the reason that all the surface dye must be washed off by this rinsing process, otherwise it there it would be a tendency to bleed. As mentioned above, it is advisable to add some washing soda to plant fiber or some vinegar to animal fiber to return them to their optimum pH in the last rinse. We just learned a little while ago that if we are dyeing animal fiber, we must finally give it a final rinse with vinegar. If we are dyeing cellulosic fiber, we should give a final rinse with washing soda. That is precisely why because the dye should adhere to the fabric and the, it, the color should not get run off in the rinsing process. So, using natural dyes 
Mordanting is one very important step. The first step of actual dyeing process is mordanting. A mordant is a chemical that when cooked with the fiber attaches itself to the fiber molecules. The dye molecule then attaches itself to the mordant. Different mordants give different colors when combined with the same dye. This is a very important factor. Now today you have learnt so many new things about natural dyeing, but when you are talking about natural dyeing, you need to understand this whole fundamental of mordant. It was not necessary to use a mordant in the case of synthetic dyes and the synthetic dyeing. But when it comes to natural dyeing, the role of mordant is very prominent and mordants are nothing but different types of metal salts of transition metals or they could be some kind of pretreatments of the tannin types or they could be enzymatic pretreatments or they could be pretreatments with uh, polyethylene glycol and so on. So, at least you must be able to understand that mordants in natural dyeing play a very vital role. For example, the dye cochineal when used with alum sulphate gives a fuchsia color. When used with tin, the color is more scarlet and when used with copper, it is purplish. Mordants except for alum and iron are considered toxic and therefore should be avoided in the preparation of eco textile. Otherwise, the whole exercise will be self-defeating. So, you see that the same dye extract can give different dye color if the mordant used is different. And they, the example of uh, cochineal is a very beautiful example because it is a nice dark purplish dye, uh, pinkish purplish dye and when it is used with alum sulphate, it remains in that color mostly. But when tin mordant is used, it becomes scarlet and when it is used with uh, copper, it becomes more on the purple or the bluish side. So, but copper, chromium, these are very toxic mordants. So, it should be a practice that these should be avoided unless and until they are used in very small quantities and the eco-friendliness test shows that they are in trace quantities on the surface of the fabric. Otherwise, they should be avoided and the use of only safe mordants like alum, iron should be encouraged. To some extent, even tin can be used. So, with this we now move on to the next chapter of mordanting and at least you will now appreciate that mordanting will uh, bring in many more new information as the mordants are toxic to the dyers and the disposal bath becomes an environmental problem. Iron and alum are the ideal mordants. Mm -hmm.